I'm here today with Jeremy Morgan uh, to talk about his latest exhibition with us, um, Tipping Point. Um, so Jeremy, I would like to know, uh, what is the importance of the type of the show to you and your practice? That's a really good question, Alex. Um, thanks for asking. Well, a tipping point, um, I guess, um, is talking, is alluding to um, perhaps my practice itself. So there are, there are tipping points between slightly older works, older ways of working, and the newer, more contemporary work which I'm, which I'm looking at. Um, but also, it's, I think it's inherent in my, in my sort of subject matter, in my interest in, in balance and sort of dynamism on, on paintings. I'm very interested in paintings which are perhaps um, uh, only just sort of balancing. You know, there's an, there's an element of jeopardy perhaps in some of the, um, in some of the um, compositions which, which I'm looking at, hence the tipping point seems quite appropriate to it perhaps. So um, you worked for many years as a graphic designer. Um, I was interested to kind of get your perspective on how important that is in your practice and the transition from being a graphic designer to being a painter. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I definitely think that being a graphic designer has kind of informed my kind of visual language, which um, is obviously um, fairly graphic, you know, a lot of hard-edged kind of geometric elements, things that you would perhaps associate with maybe logos or even app design. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from an aesthetic perspective, it's, uh, it's had an influence. Interestingly though, my painting practice, I like to think of as a sort of a, almost not really an antidote, but almost as a sort of a counterpoint mm -hmm. to my more commercial area of, of creative endeavour, yeah. being a graphic designer who's obviously fulfilling briefs for clients, branding or websites, yeah. etc. Whereas obviously with, with painting, the, if there is no brief, um, even though some of the elements can be shared from, from the graphics into the painting, um, it's very much coming at it from, with a different, um, a different intention, I suppose. And when you, you studied at the Royal College of Printmaking, so well, the London, London College of Printing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, what did you study there, and how is that? That was graphic design. Was graphic design. Yeah, yeah, that was graphic design at uh, the Royal College of Printing down at the Elephant and Castle. It's now been rebranded as the London College of Communication, mm -hmm. but the building is, is still there. Um, and it was interesting actually when I was there in the nineties. It was still a time of we had the last knockings, if you like, of, of an interest in typesetting. So mm -hmm. leading and uh, uppercase and lowercase being a reference to the, the different cases in the cupboard that the compositors would have used mm -hmm. um, once upon a time to actually set things like newspaper um, titles. So when I was actually there, we were sort of on, 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 the na on this kind of like um, edge of old school printing and design technology and newer kind of Mac and digital um, era, if you like, in the 90s. And weirdly, I would say that it's a sort of a, an ongoing hybridisation. Um, I'm interested in older technology, certainly mm. older ways of doing things, um, and trying to mix that in a kind of a hybrid way with, with more contemporary, perhaps more digital looking um, elements. I mean, I'm interested in what is the role of painting today, yeah. for instance, you know, obviously, um, it's almost a debate that's perhaps been had already, so I think we're, we're probably okay with carrying on a a millennia old tradition. Yet nevertheless there's this sort of niggling question, you know, what is the role of painting in a world that's full of YouTube or, or Instagram or digital kind of media and, and, and games and apps and things. So what I'm looking for, I think, is to kind of find an equivalence for the digital world um, in my painting practice, yeah. to, to be open to the digital world, but also to somehow reference and to let in um, elements of a more painterly, perhaps older tradition. Yeah. <laughs> so your work is heavily geometric and uses lots of bold, beautiful colours. Would you say that these two combined would constitute a visual language? Yeah, actually visual language is a, is a really interesting way to describe it. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, building up a kind, of a, a kind of a set, if you like, of visual language, mm -hmm. you know, of motifs within, within a set is definitely crucial to what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost like you could say building up a kind of a toolkit of, of parts yeah. that you can actually reassemble, you know, of digital elements which can actually be bolted together, literally and metaphorically. Because you do, you do, you construct these out of different uh, panels of wood. Exactly, yeah. So as well as the building up of the sort of different visual language motifs that you've picked up on, also a strong element of what I do is um, is to actually build the paintings in a modular way, as you say, out of, out of different bits of wood. Mm -hmm. If you like building up a, a larger painting out of smaller elements. Mm -hmm. um, so as well as the visual language, there's also the idea, I think, um, that, that I use, which is a sort of a, a modular, ever flexible way of, of doing painting. I mean, a lot of, obviously most paintings, or a fair amount of painting 
is perhaps done on a single substrate canvas or a panel or something. Um, uh, but I've slightly flipped away from that. So I think it's more interesting, personally, to build stuff up um, in very small sections and then bolt it together. It also gives me a bit of a flexibility because, of course, I'm free to jettison some panels if they're not working and even put those onto one side, maybe, and actually then bring them back for a completely different painting. So I, I find the flexibility of that, that, that creates is, is being quite, quite useful. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And you can kind of see the, the evolution from your earlier work to this newer work, which is kind of, in some ways, disregarding the bold, flat colour for something which is a bit more ethereal, a bit more see-through, a bit, you know, it's uh, there but not there. Yeah, you, you, put your, you put your finger on it, really, definitely. Um, there but not there. Tran transparent, I mean, it's obviously there's an element there, but it's, that's not the end of the story. You can actually see through the transparency to the substrate beneath. Uh, for many years, I've been interested in a sort of a, almost an industrial flat kind of finish, um, which is obviously evident in some of the um, some of the works which are on show in, in Tipping Point. Um, but more recently, I've started to be quite intrigued by allowing more light in, actually allowing more translucency and allowing the actual substrate to, if you like, um, reflect back out to, 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 to the viewer, rather well, than just to try and coat everything in a very kind of opaque surface. Um, and of course that leads to questions, doesn't it? Okay, so if we're allowing the substrate to actually show, then, then what is the substrate? And in my case, I've chosen to kind of work quite a lot on kind of plywoods with this kind of nice wood grain, which I find interesting. Again, like what I was saying earlier on, it's kind of a hybrid of sort of old, maybe organic, with a, with a newer kind of aesthetic, perhaps. Um, Next we'll be swinging on some of these amazing, amazing balls. Absolutely, yeah. No. Okay, so uh, looking at these paintings in this little room here, um, composition, and in, in your work in general, composition is so important. Like, what importance do you place in composition when you're, and how, how do you get to the point where you construct this as a, as a piece? Composition is, is important. Um, um, because I'm using quite arbitrarily sized bits of offcuts, in this case it's MDF, um, the composition, if you like, element of a painting like this is all about how do you actually get these randomly sized bits of MDF to actually work as a single composition. Um, so for something like this, where obviously we have different lengths of, um, of panels going on, um, it's almost kind of solving a, a riddle that I've, I've given myself. Um, obviously, say modernist um, painters, um, often, uh, and designers, for instance, often use the grid, often use a sort of very rational grid where everything is kind of aligned and there are certain rules, X heights, Y heights and things that you can adhere to and actually that can help you with a, com with, with a sort of a more regular composition. But for me, because I've eschewed any notion of a consistent sort of grid in terms of the structure, it creates a, a friction. It actually creates a compositional problem for me to solve, if you like, because I've got different sized mm. bits of things. Um, I mean, in this instance, it was a question of Putting these kind of motifs, these almost kind of fan motifs, yeah. at various points in the in the painting to kind of draw things together, I guess. And are you quite uh, when you find an, a piece of wood like these small strips here? Are you quite honest to how they came to you, or do you trim them down? Yeah. Uh, it, do you take some liberty with like the, the wood, or are you quite? Yeah. Well, that that's a good good, good question. I mean, I'm not a purist, so <laughs> so it's going to work as a painting because yeah. you know, but obviously the temptation might be just to simply keep the the, the exactly the same dimensions that you found these bits of wood in uh, as the sort of final painting. So it's it's a bit of um, it's a bit of toing a frame, really. It's a bit of intuition um, and actually just good old fashioned practicality. Mm -hmm. So I probably found these bits of offcuts which are of varying lengths, but it's, it's possible um, that they've all been chopped to the same sort of height just in order to <clears throat> get them to work inside the painting. Mm -hmm. but, but generally, the interesting thing is to try and get re relatively random sized bits, um, bits, uh, uh, bits of material to actually work in a single painting, I suppose, really, yeah. So in your more recent paintings, your work is, I, 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 my opinion is, kind of more sculptural. Like, do you see your paintings solely as paintings or are they something in between? It definitely objects. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting question. I, I think it's probably a stretch to see my painting as sculpture, mm -hmm. although I am interested in the whole fairly recently coined term sort of expanded painting, in other words, where does painting end and sculpture or installation perhaps begin. I would describe them probably as more objects of art, objet d'art, rather than sculptures themselves. I'm interested in the physicality of, of painting. 
and that's probably manifest in why I'm quite interested in even in things like the framing and actually how, how thick you make an edge. Did you make your own frames as well? I do make my own um, frames, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I sort of, um, and, and that's the other reason, because the substrate has actually been derived from random offcuts often. That's why there is no set size really between any of my works. They hover at a certain size, but there's actually quite a variance, mm. which might, I'm, I'm afraid, if it makes it difficult, I apologise. I don't mind it's fine, it's fine. hanging it's, stuff. It's, it's, I enjoy the challenge. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased <laughs> to hear that. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm interested, in, and I guess that comes from the fact that a lot of my material I use is from a carpenter, is from the artisan's kind of world. Mm -hmm. So, with obviously it's very strong connections to um, physicality and to sort of sculptural or three dimensional concerns, I guess. Um, but, but then, when when you have a piece like Ragged Road, which yes. Yeah. Oh. That's that's the come we can we can move around. And yeah, yeah. So right and right, this is in my opinion, this is the way we the way we placed it. It is sculpture. Yeah, I'm really excited by what you've done there, and you have. And this is This is where I, I think probably like it, it definitely falls into that almost expanded painting kind of um, uh, description. What what you what you guys have done where you where you've sort of placed it rather than rather than, hang, rather than hung it within this kind of lovely niche. Um, is, is actually really interesting, and you're absolutely right. You've actually, I would, I would describe that as almost a sort of a sculptural piece, really. There, yeah. I'm interested in in the inter in, in the intersection between sculpture and painting, and just something simple like um, standing it like that, and indeed what you've done with the other paintings in, in the window where you stood them, yes. because the frames are thick enough that they can actually self-support. Um, I find really interesting and quite exciting. In you're my head, it's actually making me slightly buzz to think of new possibilities. Well, your, your work has actually been a really, it's been quite a joy to hang. It's, uh, it gave us a lot of possibilities. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. It, was, it was a really, it was, it was, a, it was a lot. We, we enjoyed it and, and we've had a lot of great feedback. So, yeah, but thank you so much for your time. And, Cheers. Uh, I, uh, yeah, thank you so much. And please uh, check out uh, Jeremy on his Instagram. Is it Jeremy underscore R underscore Morgan? Brilliant, you'll remember. Fantastic, thank you very much. And uh, yes, and follow us at Darling Bear, and thank you very much.